Hello everyone, my name is Pedro Mortazavi and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto working with professors Konstantin Christopoulos and Osan Kwan. The project also had an industry partner, specifically Mr. Justin Binder and Dr. Mike Gray from Cascadex. So I'm going to start off my presentation with some background on the development of Castile replaceable links for use in EBFs. Then I'm going to move on to talk about the experimental program that we had. For, and then I'm going to present some results, discussions, and eventually conclusions and future work so some background on ebfs they they're not a new system they've been around for a while now um, they rely on the yielding of the segment of the floor beam between the two braces which you refer to as the link for energy dissipation in terms of their global performance they combine the performance of scbfs and mrfs so the first researcher to study these was fujimoto which was a japanese researcher in early 1970s then uh, Professor Popov with Takanashi and Roder, uh, they looked at these systems in mid-1970s and then Pro Professor Popov started uh, getting students who carried out research on these systems for uh, more than a decade. You could have a number of configurations uh, when it comes to EBFs, which you can see on the top. And at the bottom, you can see the deform shape of these. Um, pretty much everything that we're going to talk about would be applicable to all these uh, configurations. But, but let's focus on the most common configuration, which is shown on the left. When it comes to EBFs, depending on the length of the link and its sectional properties, you could either have flexural EBFs, or you could have shear critical EBFs, or you could have something in the middle. For Flexural EBFs, really what happens is that you get flexural plastic hinges at both ends on the, of the link. So really there's a big portion of the link that you're not using. In shear critical links, however, you get uniform shear yielding. So really it's the whole link is being used for energy dissipation. And that's why this is the preferred uh, mechanism in EBFs. However, like every other system, once they are deformed to large enough deformations, they will eventually fail. And the failure mechanism is often accompanied by fracture of the web close to the stiffeners or to the flanges. So these are some examples of damage to EBFs during the Christchurch earthquake. So if you look at the design of EBFs, there are certain advantages and there are certain challenges. When it comes to advantages, really drifts are controlled better compared to MRFs and the structure is not as stiff as SCBFs. However, there are some challenges with the design of EBS. One of them is that now as a structural engineer, you have another limit state that you have to control, which is the plastic rotation of the link. Another problem is that most sections like W section, HSS and so on, these sections are designed to work well in flexure, but a shear mechanism is preferred. So what we do is that we try to adjust the sections that we have to perform better in shear by detailing them with stiffeners and welds and whatnot and this procedure is challenging so that, and then the design procedure is uh, much more iterative because one you have to prevent the yielding uh, of the beam outside of the link and the other thing is that it would be challenging to obtain an optimized design solution in terms of link rotation drifts and the demand to capacity ratios of the members the other challenging part is the challenging repair procedure because now you have a portion of the floor beam after an earthquake that you have to cut and replace somehow it's been done before so it's not undoable but it's quite challenging so about a decade ago a former colleague of ours dr mansoor proposed the replaceable links in ebfs so if we go back to these design challenges that we went through dr mansoor's proposal solved a few of these problems improved some of the aspects but some other aspects still remained a challenge however replaceable links were well received by the earthquake engineering community in fact uh, a number of buildings in christchurch adopted the system both in uh, design of new structures as well as repair of damaged structures however as we discussed there's still room for improvement and that's where castile replaceable links uh, come in which are the system that we looked at in this project so castile replaceable links use the same idea in the sense that they are replaceable however they use steel casting technology which means better quality control better ductility and better low cycle fatigue life so the way these links are designed is that really it's a tapered hss 
where the capacity of this portion, which is called the yielding portion, follows the moment diagram. And the link in the yielding portion experiences simultaneous yielding. So this shows FE results of the system, which you can see the yielding part would yield and the middle part would stay elastic. And currently we have a product line consisting of nine different EBF sizes. So here the number next to the EBF shows the nominal shear capacity of the EBF in kips. And the same thing is shown in the brackets with in kilonewtons. These are the links in real size. So this is the smallest one. These four are the middle sizes. And this is the biggest size, which is EBF 290. If we go back to the design challenges that we talked about before, we believe with these proposed links, uh, we can solve all of these design challenges. We had two experimental setups. One was used to validate the performance on a component level. So really, it's a universal testing device with a uh, pure shear test setup. And uh, there are different parts to it, which I'm not going to get into. So what we did was that we first designed this test setup using first principles. And then afterwards, we did detailed FE, which you can see here. And you can also see further, uh, you know, the yielding of the yielding portions of the link and the middle segment remaining elastic. And this is another view of the experimental test setup. This is the, uh, you know, global view. If we look at more closely, this is the loading part. Um, and then another cl closer view of the link itself, you would see something like this in reality. Second setup was a frame setup used for system level experimental validation. And we wanted to test the, test the link with, with the slab and without the slab. So if we look closely, this is the link and this is the setup. Without the slab, if I remove the slab and, you know, take off the lateral support so you can better see the link. Uh, this is... A nice picture of the test setup uh, during the experiment with this lab. So let's talk about the experimental program. So in the first set of tests, we carried that component level test. We did two EBF 35s, one EBF 77, one EBF 100, and two EBF 290s. So really, uh, these are the sizes that we tested. After that, for the frame setup, we just chose to do uh, two EBF hundreds, which is the medium size link, uh, once with the slab and once without the slab. So for the protocol, we use the AISC 36041 loading protocol, which is uh, always used uh, for the pre-qualification of uh, links in EBFs. So now let's talk about the uh, results. So this is a time-lapse video of the uh, one of the component tests on EBF 77. I'm going to skip ahead to get to the exciting parts. Um, so you would see the uh, high static response on the left side. You see the view close up view of the link on the left side. And this is the global view. And uh, you would see the stable response of the link uh, going way more than the 0.08 which is the code requirement reaching 0.2 radians, which was a very good performance that we were pleased with and eventually fracturing. So looking at some similar tests, so for example, the EBF 35, similar performance, EBF 100, again, similar performance to EBF 77. EBF 290 was the only size link that we got uh, less rotation out of the link. And we uh, believe the reason is that um, for larger links, we have to increase the length to get better ductility out of them. So we also use DIC in our component level test. So just a quick example on that on EBF 35, if you look at the yielding portion and the strain profile obtained from DIC and the strain profile obtained from FE with the same limits, they match each other pretty darn good. And and therefore, DIC proved to be a good method for capturing the strain profile in our experiments. So looking at some system level test results, uh, this is a nice time lapse video which shows the uh, system level test on the EBF 100 without a slap. Uh, the high static response will appear somewhere here shortly. Appreciate that as the actuators are moving left, the link would be in compression showing on this side. And as the actuators move right, the link would be in tension showing on this side. 
and also a close-up view of the link here uh, so in these experiments um, uh, the link showed uh, less capacity compared to the component level test and the reason is that it is accompanied with tension and in fact we designed the test setup to have that uh, so uh, here we reach a rotation of 0 0.15 and then uh, it's going to continue the cycle going compression only to start failing in the other cycle you would see the failure here but interestingly as you move back the gap would close and you can get more cycles but it was at this point that we decided to finish the test uh, so if you look at the test with the slab the EBF overall performed similarly however the link uh, was able to sustain one additional cycle and this is the deform shape at the largest deformation so a few quick discussion points one that the presence of axial load would cause additional hardening uh, of the link uh, specifically at 0 0.15 radians uh, we saw an additional 1.13 overstrain uh, just because of uh, the presence of tension on the link in addition uh, when we compared the test with and without the slab we see that the, uh, the test that had the slab had a higher stiffness in loading and unloading we believe the reason is that as the system deforms and as the uh, slab cracks there's a compression field that forms and that aggregate interlock causes additional stiffness on the system so to summarize we talked about the new generation of cast seal replaceable yielding links we talked about the experimental program and the results uh, and uh, we are currently working on pseudodynamic hybrid simulations on selected ebf sizes uh, in addition to that we are also in the process of experimental validation of an alternative product line uh, in which we have increased the length of larger links to increase their rotation capacity so with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you.